Today, as we think about total fitness, we're shifting our focus to vocational fitness. Vocation is a word that means calling, to be called uh, usually by God. And so to have a vocation is to have a calling. We often use the word vocation now to refer to our paid employment, to our job, to our work. But vocation is bigger than just our job, though it's not less than that. It includes our job, but also other things that we do. Some of us who don't have paid employment at all may have very important callings and tasks to do. And as we think about uh, vocation, calling, work, job, we need to do that in light of the basic framework of the Bible. We think about the realities of work, and the first thing to know is that work is good and glorious because it's part of God's original creation and His design for us. A second important thing to know about work is that work is hard and frustrating, and that's because humanity has fallen into sin, and that sin has affected everything about us, including our work. And a third thing to know is that work is transformed in Christ, that what has come under a curse is again being transformed in the lives of believers so that we can serve the Lord Christ and begin to carry out again the original purposes that were there when God created us to be workers. So keep those things in mind. Those are kind of the basic structure of the Bible and of Christian thinking, period. And so they are also important as we think about work. Work is a part of creation. It's good and it's glorious. The Bible says that God created man in his own image. Male and female, he created them. And he said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over all the creatures that God has made. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. From the very beginning, God appointed people for work and gave us a very high calling. And the highest calling of all is basically what Genesis says. He created us in his image. He created us to image him, to be like him in some way, or also to represent him in some way. When people in the ancient Near East would hear of an image, they would often think of a king leaving his image behind in a land that he was ruling. And that image represented him, and it meant that land belonged to him. And it was an emblem of his rule. One element of being made in God's image is that we are meant to rule on his behalf. We are meant to be God's stewards, or people who represent him in reigning over the rest of creation. And that's really what work and vocation is about. To be somebody who is carrying out God's reign and representing God in relationship to all of his other creatures. God appointed humans to be in this garden, and they were to take care of that garden, and they were to expand that garden so that eventually it would fill the whole earth. And that garden was not just to be a nice place for plants and vegetables and animals and people to live in. That garden was to be a, a garden temple for God himself to dwell in, to rest in, to rejoice in. And that the whole earth was to become a garden like that. That's why God formed humanity in his image and created us to represent him. And sometimes this is called the cultural mandate, to fill the earth and to develop culture and to cultivate it. There's a sense in which the original creation was perfect and another sense in which it wasn't. It was perfect in the sense that it was all very good and that it did not have sin in it as God originally made it. But it was imperfect in another sense. Uh, the word perfect can mean mature or fully developed. And it wasn't mature and fully developed. It wasn't perfect in that sense. And humanity was there to develop it and to bring out the potential that God had placed in it. So God appoints humans to cultivate the creation, to develop culture in various ways, um, to flourish and to develop things. That's part of God's original calling for us. And it's still the roots of what work and calling are all about. We're here to make the whole earth a garden that is well tended and a temple in which God dwells. That's God's purpose for human work and for human culture. 
And so that means work is glorious. Among other things, work is glorious because our maker is a worker. He formed the heavens and the earth in those great acts of creation and continues to provide for the work of creation. Humans work in Eden before there was ever a fall into sin. Work is not just a necessary evil, but it's part of God's original design. Work is a calling from God. And the talents, the abilities that we have, are abilities that come from God that are meant to be used. Scripture praises hard work. Uh, if you've read Proverbs often enough, you know that it has nothing good to say about the lazy bones. And it has a lot good to say about hard work. And other passages of Scripture speak similarly. You will have to dig very hard and twist Scripture very badly to find good things said about laziness. Work helps others. It's a way that we serve and bless others and, and we provide for their needs by doing things we're good at. They're doing things they're good at. And when a society is all together with various people doing the things they're good at, we help to provide for each other. And that builds our ties with each other as well. We're interconnected. And the things that some of us do um, are a blessing to others. And then the skills, different skills that others have are a blessing to us, and that keeps humanity tied together, interrelated, interconnected. So these are all things that are part of the original glory of work and that still carry on into the life of work today. And that's not the whole story. Uh, work has been terribly affected by the fall into sin. And after that fall, God said to Adam, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you'll eat of it all the days of your life. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food. Humanity's sin brought a curse on the creation, and it made work painful. And that means part of vocational fitness as you live and work in a fallen world is realizing that trouble goes with the territory. <laughs> Sometimes people feel that, oh, this job is difficult. It's not a lot of fun. And some of these people are a real bother to work with. I must be in the wrong position. Well, sometimes that may be the case where you're just not a good fit for that position and you're, it's not working out with those people. But if you say every time the work is not bliss, sweetness, and light and the people are not fun and funny and great to be with 24-7, I need a different job, you will forever be switching jobs. That's like looking for that perfect church where everything is perfect, the preacher's always on, the people are always friendly and nice, and you're going to find that one. Well, you will belong to about 170 different churches in your lifetime and never find the one you're looking for. Because the fall has affected everybody and everything. So, when you get into a job and you find that this is harder than I thought, this isn't as much fun as I was expecting, these people are a pain in the neck to work with, that doesn't always mean that you ought to immediately jump to the next job because difficulty goes with the territory. And sometimes work is just plain frustrating. What does a man get for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labors under the sun? All his days his work is pain and grief. Even at, not, at night his mind does not rest. That's just part of being realistic and part of vocational fitness is being realistic about the challenges and the difficulties that work can be. You will have a boss who does not always understand you perfectly. You will have fellow workers who are hard to get along with, and you are one of them. And you will have tasks that are, don't seem to fit or that seem meaningless or that seem empty. And there will be days when you can sing very heartily the old country and western song, work your fingers to the bone, what do you get? Bony fingers. So this is part of the facts about work, but not the only facts. Sometimes work has been so distorted and so affected by the curse and the, the place where it got the worst in human institutions is in slavery. Uh, that's the, the absolute pits of what work became under the curse of sin. And when you're a slave or when you feel like a slave, uh, some of the things about a nightmare job is that your boss treats you like your property, not a person. Your tasks seem like they're tiresome and useless. You're really putting out a lot of energy and not getting much done that's valuable. You're not getting paid. You're always broke. Promotions are unavailable. You can't move up and you're really stuck 
with no other choice. That's what a nightmare job looks like. That's what slavery looked like and still looks like in places where slavery still exists today. And a dream job would be the opposite of that. Well, you would feel not like a slave, but like royalty. Your boss is perfect. Your boss loves you. The tasks you do are exciting. They're fun. They're important. You get well paid. And you get so well paid that you're getting shares in the company. And you're getting a, a big share of the owner's wealth. The promotions are unlimited. You're secure in every situation. And the interesting thing is that when the Bible talks about slavery and gives instruction to Christians who are still slaves, it speaks as though their nightmare job can be a dream job. It reminds them that, yeah, you have a human boss, but you also have the Lord Jesus Christ as your boss. And he's perfect and he loves you. And your boss may have things for you to do, but do it with all your heart, as though you're working for the Lord Jesus Christ, because some of those tasks are important, and you're always representing the Lord Jesus Christ anytime you're working. Uh, you may not be getting paid by your human boss, but you belong to Christ. All things are yours, and you are Christ's, and Christ is God's, and you have an inheritance from the Lord. The Lord is going to exalt people to a position even above the angels, and those who are faithful in small things will be entrusted with great things. And nothing can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so, even if you're stuck in a nightmare job, those instructions for slaves in the Bible remind us that you're working for somebody else. You're working for the Lord Jesus Christ. And even when sin has had a terrible impact on work, when Jesus Christ comes along, he changes your relationship to work, to your boss, to your fellow employees, to everything. Your nightmare job can become your dream job when a new view of your work changes and, and you just have that whole new view of seeing things. And it comes when you get a new boss, the Lord Jesus Christ, and a new you when you're born again and have the Spirit of Christ living within you. And if your boss is Jesus, then you can work heartily no matter who your boss is here. And you can count on a reward that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we've been looking at realities of work that it's good and glorious as God meant it and designed it at creation, that it's hard and frustrating in our fallen condition, but that it's being transformed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And vocational fitness comes from recovering that vision of creation and of realizing what it means to have the Lord Jesus Christ at work in you, reigning over you right now. We work for Christ whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You're serving the Lord Christ. So an enormously important thing to know about your work is, I work for Jesus. You will not have true vocational fitness until you can say that and mean it. I work for the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever I do, I'm really working for Him. You need to be able to say that, and you also need to be able to say something else. Christ works in me. I work for Him, and He's working in me. And that's one of the glories of work. The same Christ lives and reigns in all believers by the same Holy Spirit, and yet that doesn't produce all identical clones. He's the same Jesus, he's the same Holy Spirit, but we are very different. Christ is so richly glorious that he cannot be fully expressed in any one of us. Christ displays himself in believers who have different personalities, different domains what, of what they're good at, of where they have an impact and an influence, of where they're doing their work. And as we have these different personalities and these different domains, we're showing different facets of the one Christ's glory and reign. So the whole diversity of people who are doing the Lord's work are showing different things about the one Christ. That's another dimension of what it means to be the image of God, the image of Christ. We're portraying him. We're picturing something about Jesus by who we are in him and he in us and by how we go about our tasks, our work, our callings. 
Martin Luther phrased it as the masks of God, the fact that God is working in us. And Luther uh, wrote about the fact that God provides for people, but the way he provides for people is usually through other people. There's many passages in Scripture about God's provision for us. Psalm 145, 16 is one of those. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. Now, how does God give us our food? In the morning, when you plunk down at the breakfast table and say, Lord, thank you for this food, does something just boing? All of a sudden, it's on the table, and then you uh, wait for something else to move it to your mouth. You would not want to lift. The Bible says the sluggard is too lazy to lift <laughs> the food from his plate to his mouth. Uh, but that's not how God feeds us. Luther says God milks cows through the vocation of the milkmaids. And then he speaks of, of other tasks that people do. And he says these are the masks of God behind which he wants to remain concealed and do all things. So God puts on the mask of a milkmaid or puts on the uniform of a truck driver. And the workers in the dairy barn are getting the milk from the cows the people who manufactured the tank that the milk goes into, that refrigerated tank had something to do with that milk. The person who drives up in the milk truck and takes that milk from there and hauls it somewhere else is part of that whole chain. It goes to distributors. It goes to grocery stores. It may have something to do with the marketers of milk who are out there somewhere as well. And then it gets to the store and you get it and you bring it home and it's in your fridge and it was nice of those people to make that fridge for you. And, um, and that table, those people who made that table that you're sitting on, and those other people who made that chair that you're sitting on, and then you pour the milk into your cereal bowl, and you have your breakfast. But all along that chain of events, God was providing. The people with their various faces were masks for God. The people with their various uniforms were masks for God. When you go to the doctor, and you're seeking healing, you're seeking healing from God, but you may see the doctor wearing scrubs. When you need to have your house cleaned up and have it kept safe and, and free from unsanitary conditions, uh, the garbage people out there at the road are doing the work of God. The people who created the sewer systems were doing the work of God in making your life better and cleaner. And you can think about almost any task that's worth doing and that helps somebody else and you can see it in this light that God takes out the garbage through the vocation of the garbage man. He gets the milk milked through the vocation of those who work in those dairy barns. Uh, he makes your computers work by those geniuses who help to design them and those others who help to keep them working. Uh, almost anything that you think of in your life, uh, you can think of as a mask of God, including not just what others are doing for you, but then also what you do for others. Think of, in some respects, your own face as a mask of God and the clothes that you wear to work on Monday morning as God's uniform. Because it's true. You're not only working for Christ, but Christ is working in you and through you. And that changes the way you see your work. It changes the way uh, you go about your tasks and your responsibilities. One of the concepts that the Reformation really highlighted from the Bible again was the priesthood of all believers. And there was an emphasis that the priests are not just the people who stand behind a table and distribute communion. It's not just the pastors who speak or bishops or officials in the church, but all believers are priests unto God. You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Jesus has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. Every calling is in one important respect a priestly calling because you're doing God's work and you're working in his temple. Gardening is priestly work. It was the original priestly work of Adam and Eve. And taking care of God's creation is priestly work because the creation is God's temple. And therefore, you should never think of a priest as a church official only. I am no more a priest than you are. We all have a role to care for God's temple, 
his creation, and that is vocation. That's a calling. There was an error that crept into the church that there are certain secular callings that aren't as holy or as churchy, um, and then there were the real callings, to be a monk, uh, to be a nun, to be full-time clergy. And the Bible teaches that we're all a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood to the Lord. And that means that you serve God in all of life wherever you go. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all who dwell therein. Luther picked up on that and said the whole world could be filled with the serves of God. Not just the churches, but the home, the kitchen, the cellar, the workshop, the fields. When you're cooking a meal, you are doing God's work. You are serving God. One of the... Uh, Great books on living in the presence of God. The practice of the presence of God was written by a man who was mainly a cook working in a kitchen. So we ought to realize that God is not desiring simply to be here for an hour on Sunday mornings. He desires that his whole creation be filled with his presence and display his glory in the lives of his people 24-7 wherever they go. That's why vocation, calling, Work is so important. And there are many purposes in work. We'll look at a, at a bunch of those. And one purpose of work is simply what kind of worker you are and how you're spreading the gospel. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your hands. This doesn't sound like the highest and loftiest and noblest of all callings. We all want to be a superstar. We all want to be that big, big difference maker. And the Bible says, well, try this. Lead a quiet life. Mind your own business. and Do some work. So that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Whoever said, wow, do I admire that moocher. I think those freeloaders are some of the finest specimens of humanity I've ever come across. You know, somebody who is good at what they do, who works hard, who can be counted on, who does a great job, uh, you're not dependent on anybody, and you're winning the respect of outsiders. The Bible says something very similar in another passage where it's speaking to slaves. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters and everything. Try to please them, not to talk back to them, not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they'll make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. One purpose of work is to make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. A preacher has very limited influence. A preacher is often doing preacherly stuff, studying, getting sermons ready, talking with church people. Sometimes we speak with people who aren't in the church, but oftentimes preachers get a hearing only to the degree that the Christians who are out there in the workforce from day to day are earning a hearing making the teaching about God our Savior attractive. And if your life is making the teaching about God our Savior attractive, then people are a little more ready to listen to the actual teaching that you might share in your own way or that uh, a more full-time teacher of the Word might be able to bring to them. So making truth attractive is a tremendously important aspect of work. It's not the only purpose of work, but it's one of them. I think I've shared before some years ago uh, the story of a famous Hollywood actor who was looking for a maid. And so he interviewed a woman, and she was an immigrant. English was not even her first language. She was very poor. And he interviewed her to serve as a maid in his fancy house and asked why she wanted to work there. And she said, well, my main reason for wanting to work here is so that I can lead you to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, he kind of laughed uh, because he was a very um, ungodly person, and, and yet he thought, well, you know, she's, an in, she's interesting, um, she sounds like she'll do a good job at least, and so I'll hire her. And sure enough, over the years, she worked faithfully for him, and when she had opportunity, explained more what it meant to belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that actor became a Christian through the life of that maid who worked for him. That's what the Bible's talking about. Even if you're in a, in a very lowly position 
and it seems to be unimportant. If you're faithful, and if you want to share the Lord Jesus Christ, one of your purposes is to make truth attractive. What are some of the purposes to pursue and work? Well, one is to be a godly person and to share the gospel. Those slaves that Paul was talking to, he wanted them to stop feeling sorry for themselves. He said, you've got it better than your masters do, because you know the Lord Jesus Christ and they don't. Now make truth attractive. And if you're working in a position, you may be tempted to resent somebody who's higher up than you, who's making more money than you, who's not much fun to work for. But think of it this way. What if they don't know the Lord and you do? Then you've got it better off than they. And one of the purposes of your work may to be to help them to know the Lord. Another purpose in work is to do it well, to be skillful, to do excellent work. Whether you're a painter making great paintings or a house painter doing a great job painting a house. Whether you're the garbage person who just makes sure it gets carried away and does a great job of it. Or whether you're a programmer who's writing the best code that you possibly can. Whether you're a maintenance person who makes sure everything is running in tip-top shape. Uh, whatever it is, do it well. Do it skillfully because you're doing it for the Lord and the Lord is doing it through you, and one of the purposes of being there is just to do it excellently. And as you do it, you're glorifying God. You're honoring Him. And one purpose of work, and, and some jobs will have this to more of a degree than another, is to shape culture, to shape the way people think. If you have work, for instance, in the arts, in entertainment, that has a big impact on the way people operate. And so if you, if you can be an author, or if you can be someone who's working in the arts, you can have a, an influence on people. Another way is uh, when you're just, when you're developing technology, and as technology moves forward, you shape the way cultures operate. And, and there are many different examples that I could give. Another element of work is to try to make the whole society flourish and to make it more fair. And some jobs obviously are in the, in the fairness and justice business. If you're a policeman, if you're a judge, you're wanting to make sure that justice is done in society. If you're in politics, you should be seeking fairness and justice and not just your own fame and fortune. Uh, when you're someone who is an advocate for those who can't advocate for themselves, or if you're working in a pregnancy problem center and you're trying to help uh, people who have challenging pregnancies. These are all ways where you're trying to help society flourish and, and help those who have great needs, and many other examples could be given. And different jobs maybe are sometimes proportioned differently. If you're working in one kind of work, you might not have as much influence on the way society is shaped, but you might have more of an opportunity to share the gospel, let's say, or to just do something very skillfully and in an excellent manner. But in other work, uh, if you get into that kind of work, you say, boy, a big part of my purpose here is to make society more fair. So not every job is going to have all of these to an equal degree. These are all purposes that are mentioned by Tim Keller in his book, um, Every Good Endeavor. And he mentions these various things, and he grants that some jobs have a little bigger opportunity than others to make a difference in each of these areas. Another element of work is just, um, if you're not going to change the world, uh, you can change the world, but even if, aside from changing the world, work changes you. If, you. if you have a joyful attitude amid the ups and downs of work, a big part of life is actually preparation for the next one. Okay? You're getting ready for the next one. And so you're being faithful in small things so that later on you'll be ready to be entrusted with greater things. So when you're joyful amid the ups and downs and you go through a 30-year career of working through all the challenges of work and this and that and you're serving the Lord and you're living in His joy and in His power, you're going to be a different and better person at the end of those 30 years than when you started your work and your calling and your career. So that's not the only purpose of work, but, it, but it's a big one. What does it do to me? What kind of person is it shaping me to become? Another element of work, and again, some kinds of work serve this better than others, is that you pursue your heart's passions. You, for some of us, if you're doing what you love to do and might do even if you weren't paid to do it, 
uh, then you are truly blessed. When, when your heart's passions match up pretty closely with the employment that you actually have. And so if you're able, and even those of us who may say, well, I'm not in the ideal job they had in mind, but boy, it's a lot better than sitting in front of the TV all day. I, at least I'm doing something valuable and worthwhile, and I have a passion to make a difference. You know, to, to be, have nothing to do, nothing valuable to do when you wish you could is a very hard thing. So if you can just be pursuing a passion in your work, that is a tremendous blessing and, and its purpose to pursue. And even if you can't, let's say, uh, I never grew up with a great passion to flip burgers or make sandwiches, but that's the only job I can get. Well, earn your own living. That is an important element of work, as we've already seen from the Bible. Just paying your own way, earning your own living, and not only that, making enough so that you even have extra, so that you can share with people who don't have the good health to work or don't have job opportunities right now. And so the ability to make money, to pay your own way, and to help others who haven't been so blessed, these are all important purposes in work. And as, as you think about your own vocational fitness, don't just mosey off to work every day, or if you're not moseying off to a job, if your main work is in the home, then you need a vision for it. What's the point? What are the purposes? And under the big umbrella, it's God created me to be a worker, and Jesus has redeemed me to work for him. And as you get more specific, you need to have purposes to pursue, to make sure that you really have a sense of purpose as you do your work. How do you find your calling or callings? That's a hard question that sometimes uh, people in their late teens or early 20s struggle with a lot. Or sometimes when we hit a position in life where we need to think about leaving one kind of work and taking a new job, well, how do I know what I should do? And once again, one way to look at it is kind of like what I mentioned with breakfast, sit at the table and wait for the meal to drop down on the table. But more often, it's going to... And in the same way, you might say, well, I'm going to wait till the Lord just drops me a, a message straight from heaven and tells me this is your calling. Sometimes God does, in very extraordinary ways, give you a sense that this is what you've got to pursue, but very often not. Very often, your own wisdom and the asking of wise questions will lead you into a sense of your calling and purpose. Let me begin by just saying callings, not calling only. Because, as I've said, vocation is more than your paid employment. It's more than the job that somebody does to earn a living. Take my own uh, example. I, I work for the church as a pastor, and I work as, uh, as a teacher and president of Christian Leaders College and provost of Christian Leaders Institute. That's what I get paid to do. But that's not all I do. Um, I'm a father. That's a very important vocation and calling. I'm a husband. Even happened to be a basketball coach. That's a little lower for me on my ranking. For some people, that might be one of their highest. Uh, you know, but, but it's something I do. It's one sphere in which I can have an influence on lives. And so that's an example of callings in your own life. Some of you may not have any paid employment and still have extremely important callings. If you're a full-time parent at home, that may be a, a core calling that you have at this season of your life, and you need to do it and, and do it well. Many of the things that you don't get paid anything to do will be things that you have the biggest impact. If you think paid employment is the only vocation and the most important one, let me just mention the Apostle Paul to you. He made his money making tents. And I trust he made good ones. Hopefully there weren't a lot of holes in them. Hopefully they held up well. I trust that Paul followed his own advice and made good tents. It is not the most important thing he ever did. He made a living making tents, but he also preached the gospel. And he was the greatest missionary in the history of the world. For some of us, our paid employment is an important part of our calling, our vocation. But it might not be the most important. Some people need to make their living at one thing, but their real energies are also into something else. For instance, let's say that you're good at art. You might not get very rich at it. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. 
It does mean that it better, maybe shouldn't be plan A for how you're going to make your money, but you may still want to invest yourself in your art or in your music or in other things that don't always get highly paid, but that are still wonderful things that the Lord can use you in. Many people are a great blessing to others through what they do as volunteers, what they're not paid to do. Those who are involved in coaching. There's a few um, college and professional coaches who make a ton of money at it. Most ordinary schmoes make almost nothing at coaching. And yet, you know, I remember growing up that some of the people who had the biggest influence on me were my coaches. So the, if you choose to invest your life into the lives of young people, you might not get any money for it but you're still serving the Lord. So finding your callings means looking at the big picture, not just how you're going to get paid next week. At any rate, having said all that, when you're thinking about what you're going to do, ask yourself, what am I good at? What are my abilities? Ask yourself, what are my resources? Because if you, let's say, uh, let's say you're like a lot of kids and you say, I want to be um, a professional athlete. And you're about 17 now, and you're five foot six and 123 pounds. You need to get realistic. <laughs> if you're six eight and 220 pounds, there is a very low likelihood that you're going to be a professional athlete, okay? If you were a fabulous physical specimen, you still have about one chance in a million of being a professional athlete. So, you know, when, when we're thinking about abilities, or you want to be one of the world's great movie stars, well, it doesn't everybody, <laughs> but it's unlikely to happen. And yet, you know, I know a guy who loved acting, wanted to go into acting, and he did act. Uh, he did a fair amount of acting on the stage, but he never made enough money to live. So he worked as a bookkeeper, and he worked as a cook, and he did his acting. But that wasn't how he made all his money. So... You, you have to ask, what are my abilities, and then what, what are my resources? Where is it going to come from? Um, if you want to be a doctor, you want to be a surgeon, and you're very squeamish, and you get really upset by very small things, and you get really shaky, maybe you shouldn't be a surgeon, okay? Because you just have to have a steady hand in very intense circumstances, to be a great surgeon. Or let's say you want to be a doctor, but you're a C student. You will either need to ramp that up a lot, or you will not be a doctor because it just takes exceedingly good grades in school. That doesn't mean you're dumb, but it does mean that you're going to have to be able to go through a lot of school at a very high level, or you'll never be a doctor. And so part of finding your calling is, what am I good at? What kind of resources are available to me? And also, what do I like? What are my preferences, my personality? That doesn't decide everything, but don't sign up for something that you're just going to hate doing for the next 40 years. Okay? Uh, you, you do have to at least factor in, what do I love to do? What do I hate to do? What sort of person am I? Let's say you're really introverted. You have a hard time just striking up conversations with strangers. You probably shouldn't be in sales. <laughs> because... It, you have to be able to be at ease introducing yourself to people and talking to people whom you don't already know in many circumstances. So, again, those are just a few examples, but your personality and the kinds of things you prefer have a big role in, in finding your calling. What are your domains for impact? Where can you make a difference? You already have, if, if you have kids, you have a calling already to be a parent, and you cannot neglect it. If you have a spouse, you have a calling to be a husband or wife, and you can't neglect it. You've already got those domains of influence. And then you need to be watching for other ways. You know, where can I volunteer? Where could I get hired? Where can I make an impact? I mentioned before the possibility of, of serving the Lord uh, in, and leading other people to Christ. I know some people who are in other countries as software developers or teachers and they're really there as missionaries. But they're in countries where you can't go there as a missionary. So they, they've looked at their domain for impact. They believe God called them into missions, but they're also, they're like Paul. They're tent makers. They're working at employment that'll get them in that country and then help them to share the gospel where they go. How can you provide for yourself and others? Like I mentioned before, if... Um, 
If you love art, um, that's great and use it well, but that probably shouldn't be your plan A for providing for yourself. Maybe the opportunity will come at some point with some use of the arts, but you have to, you have to ask, now, how can I make a living? Um, how can I pay for myself and how can I pay for others? And that leads to the question, what can you do that others want? Because if you can't do anything that others want, they're not going to pay you to do it. You have to ask, what can I do that others want? And that changes over time. You will not make money anymore um, picking corn off of corn stalks. Corn pickers have been invented. The same is true of cotton. A lot of other things that employed gobs and gobs of people in agriculture 100 years ago, mechanization has just eliminated jobs like that. And, and I, I take those as obvious examples, but whenever you're thinking about what career or job should I be looking at, you have to ask, well, what are people paying others to do? And you have to do something that other people want. And another question then is just, what's your present situation? What are the opportunities you have now? Because you can say, you know what? Here is what I aspire to be, and my career is going to be thus and such 10 years from now. Well, that's fine, but do you know you're going to be around 10 years from now? You can't live 10 years in the future. You can live now. And I know some people that are right now are working at something, and they hope to be in something else eventually. But do well at whatever you're in right now. And as I said before, it's going to develop the kind of person you are and make you more capable for anything else that you tackle in the future. But take your present situation as it is, not just your future situation as you hope it will be. Because you are called to serve the Lord right now, not to start serving Him five years from now or 12 years from now. Find your callings where you can be serving Him right now. So as you think about your own calling and vocation, do that prayerfully. Sometimes do that with other people. Because when you look in the mirror, you don't always see very clearly. Sometimes other people look at you and see things in you that you do not even see in yourself. I mentioned before, when I was home from college one summer majoring in math, my, um, my pastor just asked, hey, you want to come over? We, so I talked with him for an hour and he asked me a question. Dave, have you ever thought of going into the ministry? And I had given it, given it some passing thoughts, but... You know, but he saw something in me that, you know, was only a little bit on my radar at that time. And that can be true of a lot of people. They're, when you know somebody else and you see something in them, don't be shy about talking to them about it. And if you're a person who, if you're a young person or even if you're an older person and you're kind of wondering about job situations, about what's my purpose, what's my calling, what am I here for, Think about it, pray about it, but then also ask somebody else about it. Ask what they see in you. And that can really help you to map out your way. And then bloom where you're planted. The apostle, again, just taking some of his advice to slaves. Each one should remain in the situation which he was in when God called him. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. So seize better opportunities if they come, but first excel in your present situation, okay? Now is when you can serve the Lord. And if greater opportunities come, then seize them as God brings them. But don't forget to bloom where you're planted right now. I love the story of Joseph. I'll mention him a little bit more in a future message as well. But Joseph, after his brothers sold him into slavery, was the best slave he could be, and soon he was in charge of the place. Then when he was falsely accused, he got thrown into prison. Well, he was the best prisoner in the prison. And soon the warden had him running the place. And eventually, the king of Egypt had him running Egypt. Because that's just the kind of guy he was. The Lord blessed him and guided him. And he was just the best he could be wherever he happened to be put. Whether it was a miserable situation. And so, seize better opportunities if they come. But just excel at whatever you're doing right now. Those are some of the realities of work. It's good and glorious, it's hard and it's frustrating, it's transformed in Christ. And it is a tremendous, this is where most of us live most of our life, is in the various callings that God gives us. If you can't glorify God here, you're going to be missing out on 98% of your life. 
So may God give each of us the grace to have the vision to know that we work for Christ and that Christ is working through us. We pray, Lord, that you will indeed uh, just give us a sense of your purpose, your calling, your vocation on the various dimensions of our life. Help us, Lord, to find purpose and satisfaction in working for you and in knowing that your Holy Spirit is accomplishing great purposes through us. Help us, Lord, to value the work of other people the work that so benefits us in ways beyond that we can even measure, that almost everything we eat, almost everything we wear, everything in our home, so much in our relationships comes from the work and the labors of other people and, and you're blessing us through them. So give us a heart of gratitude to you and to them for all of that valuable work and give us too, Lord, a sense of value and purpose in the things that we do that make a difference in the lives of others. Lord, may we also be free from just the discouragements that come from dealing with the curse and the hardship of work. Deliver us increasingly, Lord, from the impact of sin on the way we do our own work so that we can do it in a holy and righteous and honorable way, a way that blesses others and honors Christ. And we pray, Lord, for each of us in our places of employment. Sometimes, Lord, we have hard people to work with, and sometimes we're hard to work with. And so we pray that more and more we can shine with the light of Jesus that we can be patient and loving towards those who are in our places of employment, that we can deal with those who are our bosses or those who work under us, and that as you've called us, that we can live for you and honor you and bless the lives of others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.